It got real quiet in here. How's everyone doing this morning? I'm just going to give you a little precursor. I can, you can probably hear it in my voice. I woke up this morning and could hardly talk. Sister Carrie said, well, I know I was praying so hard for you last night. I said, you didn't pray hard enough. God's good. Amen. We're going to get through this together. If I back off, you just keep singing. Okay. Are you guys awake? I mean, if I'm up here about to lose my voice, I'm going to need you guys to stand up and worship him with me this morning. Okay. We're going to sing a song called trust you completely in a little bit. And that's what I'm doing today. Amen. Let's worship him this morning. Lord, we're going to take you at your word. Amen. Hallelujah. You may think Joe Cocker's on the stage at one point today. This, that's about how rough it is. But God, you're good. And you're great. Hallelujah. Yeah. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only Show sure. 
so I'm gonna put this cough drop in. If I choke on it, somebody come to my rescue, <laughs> all right? Go ahead, Jeremy. I told you I sound like Joe Cocker this morning. Got somebody famous singing here for you. God's good, regardless. you this morning, Jesus. We put our trust and our hope in you alone, and we just want to abide in you today, Father. Help me sing it today, church. This is our anthem. 
we abide because you first loved us, Jesus. Hallelujah. We want to know you more. We want to be in you today, Jesus, as pastors preaching. extravagant amounts of time with him is what that means 
that we are connected to him, that we are united to him. What we've been talking about in this series, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And we should glorify him because he's worthy. We should glorify him because he never leaves us. He never forsakes us, as we just sang. We can glorify him because he always keeps his word. He is always faithful. All his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we have a lot of people who are sick. The whole Jackson clan are sick. Also, please remember to keep Trip Rodden in your prayer. I know I think some of the test results are supposed to come back today. Just keep him in your prayer. and uh, Just a lot of people who are out, and we just continue to pray for them. But let's also pray that our hearts, while we're here, will be fertile soil to receive the Word of God and that it will bear fruit in our life. For it never returns void. It's not a matter of if God is going to speak to us today. It's just, are we going to hear him? And if so, are we going to become doers of his word and not just hearers only? And again, as always, we pray for our one. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we glorify you. We glorify you that you have grafted us in, that you have adopted us, brought us into your family, redeemed us, justified us, reconciled us back to yourself and that we abide in you, that we live in you, and you abide in us. It is a truth, a reality brought about by your grace and your love. And I pray, Lord God, again, that you will help us to open our eyes and to awaken to this amazing truth. And I pray, Lord God, for those who are ill, I pray by your name and by your grace that you will touch their bodies and you will heal them by a means of your choosing. Touch them, Lord God, and encourage them. I pray that our hearts during this service will be pleasing to you and will be open to receive that which you desire to save to us. And I also pray, Lord God, that you will reach out to the person that we've been praying for week after week after week. At times we can get discouraged. At times we may lose heart. But we're going to continue calling their name, asking, Lord God, for you to save their soul. And I pray the name of Aladdin as other names are being prayed. We just pray that in your way, in your time, by your means, you will bring them into salvation, bring them into a relationship with you so that heaven and your church can rejoice that the lost have been found, that the dead have been raised. We pray this in Jesus' name and may this service glorify you with every heart, every attitude, every motivation. In your name we pray, and the church said, amen and amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue worship today with the taking of Holy Communion. And as always, we want to be sure that we do this with the right heart, with the utmost respect, not half-heartedly, not unworthily. I also always want to emphasize that this is reserved for only those who are born again children of God, born through the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's just take a moment to reflect on what Jesus done for us. It's not something that's just 2,000 years ago. It is as much a reality today as it was then. Something that should impact our lives, that we should remember what he did. We should remember that by doing so, he grafted us, he adopted us into the family of God, what the Bible calls his church, and that we have a hope, not a hope of uncertainty, but a hope of absolute certainty that one day he will come and bring us to be with him forever. So let's take a moment to reflect. thank you. We thank you for these elements, the juice, the bread. We thank you for what they represent. We thank you for our salvation. And we
we pray as we come by your invitation to your table to partake of Holy Communion with you, that we will do so and that we will remember, that we will do so and we will reflect on all that you have done for us, all that it means and the hope that we still have of your return. And we pray for that return and we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But as we take these elements, I just pray that they will help us to remember your love for us, what you did for us. And I pray that you will bless them accordingly in Christ's name. Ushers, you can come. come from the outside aisles, returning from the inside. It represents, of course, the broken body of our Lord Jesus that was broken for us, scourged, beaten, hair from his face ripped, mocked, spit upon. Not the face of a criminal, but the face of God for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, I'll be skipping the first verse. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. The juice, of course, represents his precious blood. Blood that was spilt for us. The sacrifice of God himself to reconcile us back to himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25 through 29, I mean, sorry, verse 25, it says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your plan of salvation. It might not have been the way we would have done it, but it was perfect in every way, the only way that it could be done. We thank you for sending the Son. And Jesus, we thank you for coming so willingly to die on our behalf, a love that we can barely, barely even begin to comprehend. And we thank you that you've invited us to this table a table that we cannot earn to be at, a table that we cannot work for and deserve, but a table that we come only by your grace. And I pray that we will remember what you've done for us and that it will be the lens in which we see everything else in our life, knowing how much you love us. In your name we pray, amen. amen. We'll continue our worship with the giving of tithes and offerings. Ushers, you can go ahead and come. As always, we want to give unto the Lord give with love and appreciation and give with the expectance and assurance of God's provision. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've given. We are indeed a blessed people on this earth. We thank you, Lord God, for you, all you provide, the jobs you provide, the finances, the food, the closing, the breath that we breathe, the beat of our heart. As we give back to you the portion in which you have required and then we give an abundance of that in the offering, we pray, Lord God, that you will use it for your glory and for your purpose. In your name we pray, amen. so much for your giving. Uh, we want to welcome you to our service and for those who are online, we want to welcome you as well. Uh, we encourage you to like, comment, and share in order to uh, ensure that more people have the possibility of seeing the Word of God. Uh, also, we want to thank everyone who came out last Sunday night in the cold and the rain to pass out candy at the trunk or treat. I'm sure that's why some people are probably sick. Uh, but we appreciate it anyway, and I just really, uh, I, I do appreciate that. I know one thing, I never want to see a hot dog for at least another year, because uh, being down, I, I, would, I think I would have rather been in the cold than messing with 200 hot dogs. Uh, some announcements, actually a good bit of announcements, but we'll try to go through them quickly. Next Sunday, we are going to call Veterans Appreciation Sunday, and this is uh, because of Veterans Day coming up. And... Uh, we want to ask everyone who will to either wear our nation's colors or if you served, that you can wear uh, your branch of service if you have an Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard shirt, whatever, uh, Marines, uh, even if you, uh, ha or you had someone in your family serve. But just we're going to do that next Sunday just to remember those who have served in our nation's armed services. Uh, also, Peanut Brittle is... Uh, in the process and so it, I'm guessing it's on sale already or yeah it's on sale six dollars for eight ounces 
and we still need people to sign up and to help. Uh, I know they're going to be doing it, I think you said Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, right? And uh, you can just get with Carrie or the sign-up sheets outside for that. And also, we're going to uh, go ahead and announce that this will be our last year. Uh, Carrie and I talked about it. Unless someone else wants to volunteer to organize it, run it, and try to get the volunteers, we're going to say goodbye to the tradition of Kincaid Church of God making peanut brittle. Uh, there are various reasons for this, but I think for one, our older generation who really is the one who, who, who really kept it going and, and still keeps it going is just getting to the point where they can't do it anymore. And, uh, and you say, well, what about the women's ministry and the funds of the women's ministry? God will provide. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure something else out. So unless someone actually says, no, I really want to keep this going and I want to be the peanut, peanut brittle man or woman of Kincaid Church of God, then this will be the last year of this. Uh, okay. Also, we want to remind you of the second annual men's soup and chili cook-off on November 19th. That's coming up. Okay. Uh, Brother Ronnie is not here, but you need to let him know if you want to enter your chili. Now, your wife can help but your wife cannot cook it for you, all right? And so you've got to at least be in the preparation of it and all that kind of stuff, and please wash your hands. Uh, we do have a trophy if we can get Brent to give it, front, give it back to us, and uh, there will be also some sort of prize that goes along with it financially or some kind of gift. Uh, no, this is something new. As soon, as soon as I found out you had to work, I'm like, we need to have a financial gift. <laughs> that's, that's a new thing. So. You can always switch days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but again, this is soup or chili. I know there are people who complain that Brent's chili wasn't chili. Hey, I was a judge. I thought it was great. But this year, I will not be the judge or my family. So. <laughs> yeah. We might have to make a deal with Lindy to sneak it out and get it from him. <laughs> Also, uh, in, in December, I haven't chosen the day or days yet. We're going to have a manger offering. Again, this will go to fund our children's ministry. Uh, currently, as I've talked about, children and youth are together, and we're going to separate that. But children, it's kind of hard for them to have any sort of fundraiser. So we're going to do this, and I plan on this being something that we do every year at Christmas time, an uh, uh, offering in which we will put three, uh, three mangers in the uh, altar area and you will come and bring your gift and this will help support our children's ministry uh, for the next for hopefully the next year if you provide uh, well enough if not we'll come up with something else I promise uh, we also want to announce a change in our prayer meeting you may or you may not even know we have always since I've been here we've had prayer on Monday nights as of today that will no longer take place uh, mostly because of no one's coming. And so we want to try something else. We want to try to make it a little easier because we want to pray as a family together. And I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing anyone for not coming. I know some of you, you work, some of you live quite far off and to come here for an hour to pray would be very difficult. So what we're going to do is starting in January, on the first Sunday of every month, at Sunday evening, we're going to have a time of prayer together. No music, nothing but just praying together. Primarily to pray for our church and for our community and our nation. But we will also include uh, special needs if they arise. So that will start in January. And so I encourage you on the first Sunday of the month to gather together to pray. And we're going to, we're going to work out the details and just see how it goes uh, and to try that. I also, this is not on the screen. Uh, Carrie and I have been praying about something for a long time. And everywhere we've been, we've seen this need. And there's been many, many times we've thought about, we really need to do this, we really need to do that. And this week, uh, we made the decision for Carrie to go ahead and do this. Uh, Carrie is going to go back to school. And she's going to get a master's in counseling. Because everywhere that we have ever been, the need for good Christian counseling has been present. And this area, it, it's really needed. 
I had considered doing it, but there was just no way that I would have the time with being able to prepare for sermons and uh, Wednesday and Sunday morning teachings. So she is going to, she's been looking at schools and she's gonna start this. We have z no idea how we're gonna pay for it because Leander and Kendra will be going to college also. So the, all three of them hopefully will graduate at the same time. Hopefully we get a really good discount for three people being in school, but I doubt it. Uh, but just be in prayer for her. But this also needs means that we're gonna need people to step up a little bit while she's in school so that she can have time to, to study and to write papers and all the things that are involved in that. Uh, there are many areas in this church where people can help out and help carry out in what she does. One of those areas is helping to clean. We have a rotation of people who clean the church so people don't have to do it all the time and you could join in that rotation which would mean other people don't have to do it as often and that would also help. And then there's also some office things where people could, if you have some free time, could just not necessarily every week, but when you have time to help out for that, okay? But be in prayer for Carrie. She ain't been in school in a long time. And she's got a big wake up call waiting for her. I remember when I did my doctorate, it had been several years before I was in school, I went and I had a notebook and a pen and I sit down at the table and everybody else had their computers open and I realized, uh-oh, I am out of date. And I had to kind of modernize very quickly, but keep her in prayer. And this, we're only doing this for the community and for this church uh, that we can offer not only pastoral counseling, which I am qualified to do, but clinical count. And she's gonna get a license and everything and in order to, uh, to minister to the people of our area because it is so desperately needed. All right, our memory verse for today is Ephesians 4, 24. And put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And again, the card is on the welcome desk if you're taking those. Children, do we have any children that are here today? Come forward for Children's Church. Do we have anybody today? Okay, great. Yeah, do keep trip in your prayers. Uh, Thankfully, there was no meningitis in his, they did a spinal tap, but uh, we just still want to keep him in prayer. Let's pray for our kids. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for our children. We thank you for their life. We thank you for their teachers. We pray that their time will be blessed by you, that they will learn something about you and draw closer to you. In Christ's name, amen. Now, in this sermon, this sermon was a real, I, I struggled all week with the sermon because in some ways I wanted to make it two sermons, but I decided that I was going to try to put everything into one sermon, so I'm a little pressed for time, uh, and I also want to encourage you to listen carefully because it is a little, uh, a little complex in some ways. And this is the fourth sermon in the in series that I called it about us being in Christ or in him being in us or the union with Christ. And today we're going to talk about that. And in this series, we've talked about how we close the gap between the truth and promises of God's word and the daily lives in which we live and that don't live up to what God's word says and how we should live. And that we do this through the amazing truth of our union with Christ, the fact that God is in us and we are in him. Now, over the next four weeks, we're going to try to answer four questions. One is about our identity today, and then about our destiny, then about our purpose, and then about our hope. Today, we're going to try to answer the question of who am I, and then where am I headed, what should I be doing, and what can I hope for along the way? And it's my absolute belief, my total confidence that if we can come to grasp of the amazing truth about our union with Christ and move that truth not only in from our head not only have it in our head but also move it down into our heart you and I will never ever be the same so let's pray our prayer as we enter God's word today make the book live to me O lord 
Show me yourself with your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior and make the book live to me for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, the whole question of who am I is a question of identity. And as Americans, we love stories that kind of try to center on the search for identity. Some very popular versions of this are Pinocchio, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella. All of those focus on who looking for either a new identity or trying to recover an old identity. Uh, author Ralph Ellison, who wrote the book Invisible Man, called the search for identity the American theme. Huckleberry Finn, Princess Elsa, and Luke Skywalker are all stories about our identity. And if you don't know who Luke Skywalker is, I will pray for you. So. <laughs> I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So, But perhaps we love stories with the search for identity as their dominant theme because the search for identity dominates our life. We long to be like Pinocchio, to be real. We long to be like Jake Gatsby and Huckleberry Finn, just to be somebody. We long to be like Rocky, to go the distance and, know, and, to, to, and to know that we're just not some bum from the neighborhood. Union with Christ gives us our identity. It tells us who we are. It provides a new understanding that is found not within ourself, but outside of ourself in the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Christian faith, our faith, is a faith, the whole object of our faith is trying to find our identity in Jesus. The world tries to tell us that you are what you make yourself, that you are what you do, that you are what you achieve or what you possess. But our union with Jesus tells us that we can only discover our true self through the intimate relationship we have with him. You are not and cannot be self-made. That is a lie of our world, a lie of our culture. It's a myth. You can only ever truly understand who you really are in communion with God and through that with other people. Even though that goes against everything our culture is trying to tell us today, it is actually a reality. This is why people are so messed up in our world today. Union with Christ is attempting to give us a new worldview. And we talked about this in the Sunday school class this morning, a new worldview, a new perspective. If you want to know what a worldview is, probably the easiest way to explain it, it's kind of like the lens in which you see everything, like the glasses that you're looking through. It's how you interpret everything around you is what our worldview is. And Christianity seeks to give us a new worldview. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on thing, things above, not on earthly things. Now that verse is not telling us to daydream all the time, but to think and see things differently. It's about perspective. It's about worldview to have a new way of understanding everything around us, including ourself. We have a new filter to run everything in our life, everything that takes place through this filter. What happens to you and me does not define us. I want to say that again. Whatever has happened in your life does not have to define you. It's how you see it how you interpret it. That's what matters. That's what is important. Whatever happens, how you see what happens, the perspective you have on what happens that determines how that will affect your life. Our identity is formed in how we see things. Our perspective, our worldview, our mindset, whatever word you want to use, how we interpret and think about things, the lens in which we view all things is what determines how our identity is formed. And a person can change their worldview, their perspective. Even non-Christians believe this, okay? Let me give you an example. I'm an American. I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, raised in Arab, Alabama, okay? 
Whistled Dixie, growing up, all that kind of stuff. However, I am not completely like most of you. One, I was raised in a different area, but I spent 26 years of my life in other countries, with other cultures and other people. My worldview during that time changed. It had to change or I would never have been effective. My world is different because of some of my experiences. And allowing, however, to allow my worldview to change as a missionary was a choice. I had to choose to allow it to change. I've met many missionaries who go overseas and they want to stay with the same worldview and usually they're not effective. But I wanted mine to change, why? Because I knew I had to become all things to all people with the hope that I might win some. That's what Paul says. So I work to see things through other people's eyes, to see it from their perspective, from their worldview in order to bring the gospel to them. As a missionary, if your worldview doesn't change, you will not be effective. And that is not just in what you wear or what you eat, but how you perceive things, how you see. But you might be asking, I'm not a missionary. Why should I change my worldview? Why should I change my perspective? Because Christ compels you to do so. He compels you. It is about to, ha you know, he tells us to have the mind of Christ, to take all thoughts captive to Christ. This is about changing our worldview, to see things from his perspective, not our perspective, from Christ's worldview, not our worldview. This brings out a completely new way of thinking that is absolutely 100% countercultural. But it also opens the door for a new and a real identity in Christ Jesus. The problem in the church today is most contemporary Christians have their ticket to heaven, but have never changed their way of thinking. They haven't embraced their, their new identity in Christ, but they still live in their old identity. They're still interpreting things the way they have always done instead of the way that Christ desires them to. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The last one is our memory verse. I wanted to make all of them their memory verse, but I couldn't make it fit on that little card. Okay. Sorry. It's not always spiritual reasons. <laughs> But when things happen, good or bad, even tragic, we always see them through the worldview of our world, the worldview of our culture, the worldview of our family, when we are supposed to see them through the worldview of Christ, to see them the way Jesus sees them, okay? Biblical thinking, if you will. And again, biblical thinking is not me thinking about the Bible. Biblical thinking is me thinking about everything else through the Bible. This is, when we get to the book of James, we will see this very, very clearly when James is talking about that when we experience trials and tribulations of all different kinds, that we should count them as joy. How many of you do that? How many of you had a difficulty this week? Just raise your hand, other than peanut brittle, okay? okay. How many of you counted it as joy when it happened? Yes, I have a difficulty. Well, when we get into James, we'll talk about how we can do that. But how we can do that is through the biblical worldview in which most of us have not fully yet grasped. And probably, I mean, we'll do it for the rest of our life. Because we see things that happen to us, we interpret the things that happen to us in the way of the world, not in the way of Scripture. Today, the world is actually trying to tell us that you can choose whatever identity you want. Just pick one out and choose it. We're told to choose our identity, which actually suggests that we're in control of our story. We're told, be a rebel and make your own rules. We're told that a boy can choose to be a girl, and a girl can choose to be a boy, and that people can even choose to be a cat or some other sort of type of animal. Our culture breeds this type of thinking. They don't call it a Wii phone. They call it iPhone. 
because it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about me choosing my whole life. We try to make everything about us. And these things are linked together because the stress in our culture is on unlimited individual freedom. Un un unlimited freedom is called chaos, which is what we see happening in our nation today. And there's problems with this. The problem with this, this cultural promise of being able to choose our own identity, to choose whatever we want, falls very short of what it promises. A boy that chooses to be a girl, no matter what he cuts off, is still biologically a boy. He cannot ever become a girl. It is impossible. He could become a eunuch, but not a boy, not a girl, and vice versa. Because you choose to have the identity of an animal does not make you an animal. It makes you lack reason. Now, I wanted to use the word stupid, but I wrote it out. And it means you need real, genuine psychological help. There's five problems, and I'm going to tell you, five problems with choosing your own identity. And i got to go through these quick. I'm on page four, and i got 15 pages, all right? Number one... Five problems with choosing your own identity. Number one, such unlimited freedom leads to paralysis. The promise is that you can do anything. You can be anything, whatever you want. The choice is up to you. Now, that sounds good. But when you have unlimited choices combined with personal choice, it often leads to paralysis. The weight of the possibilities are just too heavy. Let me give you a small example, and I, I gave this in the Sunday school class this morning. When we were in China, when we were in China, and not a whole lot of Western people were in China, there wasn't hardly any Western products. When we first went there, you could get M&Ms every now and then, and Coca-Cola every now and then, nothing else, okay? And not Diet Coke, Coke Zero, and all that other Coke, just Coke, okay? And then about our third year, a, a little store moved in that started selling a few more American products, and one, you could go buy a box of cornflakes for $15 a box. Now, I'm going to tell you, I paid $15 a box for cornflakes many times. Why? Because if you ate Chinese food every day for three years, three times a day, cornflakes taste really good. But when I would go in, you look, what kind of cereal I want? There's only one, cornflakes, and you take it and you go home and eat it. But then we came back to America, and I went to Walmart. And I went to the cereal aisle at Walmart. That's very, very long. And now I even notice on both sides. And there's not just one cornflakes. There's 50 times the cornflakes. And I'm not joking. I was standing in Walmart, and you know that's scary. I began to cry. Because the, 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 the object of that many choices that I had to choose depended upon me. And I left with no cereal because it, it paralyzed me. Number two, a, a problem with choosing our own identity, it leads to greater stress and anxiety. The rate of anxiety, depression, and stress are higher in America today than any time in history. In fact, any time in the world. We can do anything, we can be anything, but that feeling brings inadequacy. We, we, you know, we combine be a rebel with the cultural pressure of standing out socially and being different with be like everybody else. All of this increases stress and anxiety and depression due to the competition of our individualistic culture. Even if you are one of the few who actually knows what you want to do with your life and who you want to be, well, now you got to go do it. And you got to keep it up. This creates unrelenting pressure that no matter how much success you have, it will never, ever feel that satisfaction or relief. Because there is always what's next. And if you don't make it, or you can't make it, and it's all up to you, and you fail, then you're just a loser. And such living is what we call the age of anxiety. The third thing that it does is it cultivates discontentment. 
The concept that more choices equal greater happiness is an absolute myth. Have you ever went and, have you bought jeans lately? Blue jeans? Okay. Okay. I went to Walmart and looked at jeans. Okay. I'm cheap. All right. I went to Walmart and I get 10% off because my mom. Okay. They have zip fly, button fly, no fly, low rise, high rise, medium rise, slim fit, relaxed fit, easy fit, no fit, stone washed, acid washed, no washed, holes or no holes, stressed or non-stressed, and it goes on forever. You think you would leave thinking, I just bought the most perfect pair of jeans ever. But then you find yourself, eh, not really satisfied. Always wondering, I should have got the other ones. I should have bought the other ones. I should have bought those, and I should have bought these. Why? Because increased choices brings unreasonable expectations of how good that choice should actually be. So you buy something, and then you go home and thinking, well, this ain't as good as I thought. I'll go back and buy the other thing. Okay? Okay, back to the illustration about the cereal. You go home, you, you go to Walmart, and you see 40 different kinds of cornflakes, and you buy this kind. And while you're sitting there eating those cornflakes, you're thinking, I bet you those other ones taste better because of those unrealized, unreasonable expectations. With so many choices, one should be perfect, right? Which leads to increased dissatisfaction with what you chose, which leads to discontentment. And the, and the retail companies know this. Why do you think they offer so many choices? Because they know you'll come back and come back and come back because you will never, ever be satisfied. Now think about this same concept with family. Dating and marriage. We have these high expectations of what marriage is supposed to be. A Hollywood or Bollywood mentality of marriage. But then we get married and realize it ain't like Hollywood. And we start thinking, if I'd only married that other guy or that other girl. Maybe if I left this person for that person, I would be happier. The same thing applies there. When you consider all the possibilities and choices of what you don't have, against the limitations of what you do have, dissatisfaction and discontent result, no matter what you choose. Or you end up choosing not at all, which leads to a generation of no commitment. Does that sound familiar? We may have more choices than we ever have, but we're less content than we've ever been. And then fourth thing, it robs the freedom that it actually promises. In all of history, never has a culture spoke more of freedom than ours today, but experienced it less than we do today. We no longer know who we are. We don't know who we are as individuals. We don't know who we are as a people. We don't know who we are as a nation. Have you ever watched Frozen? Come on, admit it. I got two daughters. I got an excuse. Now, if you don't have daughters, <laughs> have you ever watched Frozen? It's a movie. It's okay. You're not going to go to hell. All right? I'm not setting you up. In Frozen, Princess Elsa sings a song called Let It Go. It's a horrible song. You might like it, but I don't. But in this song, while she's singing this song, the song is about her choice to be free while at the same time locking herself into a prison of ice of her own making. Think about that. The fifth thing trying to choose our own identity does, it strongly affects how we view God. And I don't think any time in history of the church have we probably, as Christians, many people had the wrong view of God as we do now. We choose our own, choosing our own identity leads us to view and treat God as a distant God who we only come to at our convenience. You say, well, that's not true. Really? Look at your life and tell me that's not true. Look at the pew beside you and tell me that's not true. We come when we feel like it or have nothing better to do. We pray only when we need something. We rarely, if ever, read the Bible. 
Our conversations outside of church are filled with many things, but God is rarely one of them. We never mention God to those around us in our family, at our workplace, or in our community. Yeah, sometimes we place God in our plans when it's convenient, but we certainly don't want God to make our choices for us. In our vain quest to discover our true self, we often see God as the authority figure who only seeks to hinder our freedom. We want God to be on call for us when we get into trouble or need help. But other than that, we don't want him interfering in our life. The worldview, your worldview, our perspective, our mindset is like the pair of glasses that we see everything through. We might not even realize that they're there. And we might not realize we need to change them. We might not realize that the world has put them on us and we need to take them off and replace them with Christ's eyes and Christ's mind. We might be tempted to think, it's just the way I am. This is just the way everybody thinks. It's just the way things are. But all of that is a lie that we have been sold and bought fully because it doesn't have to be that way. There is another way. There is good news. And that good news is called union with Christ. The biblical Christian worldview is so foreign, so unreal, you might even think it's not possible. It can't be done. It's so revolutionary, so countercultural, you might think you can't do it. That's exactly what the devil wants you to think. But it's real. And because of our union with Christ, because the, it, it makes it real, because the Holy Spirit is real, who makes our union with Christ a reality. Our union with Christ is the worldview that Jesus calls us to, the mindset he provides, the identity we've been looking for. So I'm going to give you five ways now, five ways our union with Christ provides our identity. Number one, it heals our paralysis. Okay? The worldview of the world creates it. Ours, the one in Christ, heals it. It gives us permission to rest. We don't have to be burdened by the weight of the possible. While we still have many choices, our union with Christ shows us that there's only one choice, and that is the most important and essential choice. You say, well, what choice is that? God's will be done, not mine. God's will. If we choose God's will, it eliminates all other choices. Now, that might not help you in buying a box of cereal, but it will help you in finding your identity in Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you something, God don't care what box of cereal you eat. Well, he might if you're eating one that's probably like 90% plastic, but I don't know. As long as our will is set on God's will, his way, following him no matter what, we can rest in our choices. We can rest in the choices we make if our heart is set on doing his will. We don't have to be afraid because our life is no longer ours. Our future is no longer ours. It's no longer in your hands or my hands. Your future is not your future. God has planned it for you. You don't have to make any choices except following God wherever he leads. We can surrender our plans to Jesus because his plans have been united with ours through Christ. And I'll just say this, his plans are much better than ours anyway. When I look back at my life, the times in which God asked me to do things I didn't want to do, always they're better. Always. Even when I look back and we, you know, leaving Dubai and leaving you know, a church family there and all that kind of stuff, as I reflect, it was a better choice. One I would have never made on my own, but I said, God's will be done. I want your will, your way, no matter what it means, no matter the cost. And I can say this with absolute purity of heart, it's better. But it also, number two, it heals our anxiety. We no longer have to try to justify ourselves by our own work because we've died to that way of living. The feeling of inadequacy and fear of failure that we have are now hidden in Christ. 
Now, please listen very, very, very carefully. Poke your neighbor and make sure they're awake. You are significant. You are secure. You are accepted. You are justified and not because of anything you have done. Galatians 2.16, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. That's not what justifies you. You don't have to justify your life. You can't justify it. Christ did it for you. You don't have to pretend. You can be real. You don't have to worry. You're not a nobody. You can go the distance. You're not a bum. Christ brought you into himself and he made you somebody. He took your sin and gave you his righteousness, the great exchange. You are significant. Why? Because Jesus says so. Jesus makes you so. You are secure. Why? Because Jesus gathers you to himself and he protects you. Isaiah 40 and 11, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. young. You are accepted. Now listen, please, hear this. You are accepted, but that acceptance is not and cannot be earned. It's given by grace. Now that doesn't mean you can stop working. That doesn't mean you stop striving, that you stop putting forth effort. But it means that you can do so now absolutely, totally in a new way. You no longer work for acceptance. You work from acceptance. Now, that's really good, so I'm going to say that again. I wish I could claim it, but I can't remember who said it, but it's not mine. You no longer work for acceptance. You work from acceptance. You have been chosen. You have been crowned by Jesus Christ. Now, everything you do, you can do with all you have in delight of the one who gives you strength to do it. The third thing, our union with Christ heals our discontentment. We can be content and satisfied because of our union with Jesus. Philippians 4, 11 through 13, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things, all this through him who gives me strength. Now, we, always, we, all, we like to quote verse 13, but we like to forget 11 and 12 of what the context of that is. Now, one thing we need to note from that scripture, Paul, the apostle Paul, he had to learn it. He said, I learned to be content. But the secret of this lies in verse 13. It is in Christ, in Christ in us, by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit that we can do all things, that we can be content in every circumstance. Union with Christ is the antidote for the poison of discontentment. Psalm 23 and 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want anything. Number four, it frees us. Absolute freedom is a myth. Let me give you an example. I like fish. I don't try to keep fish because I kill them all the time. I, I, I love the aquariums. I love that kind of thing. And have you ever looked at a fish bowl? In a fish bowl, the fish is confined. He's limited. He can't just do whatever he wants. But if you shatter that fish bowl, thinking you're freeing the fish and removing all his constraints, the fish's situation doesn't really get better, does it? In fact, it gets a whole lot worse. To remove the constraints of the bowl 
would destroy the fish. Union with Christ shows us that Jesus is the center of our existence. That we cannot understand who we are until we understand who he is and what he's done for us. But union with Christ is not, he's not just our center, he is also our circumference, our border, our boundary, our perimeter, our fishbowl, if you will. He provides for us the boundaries of what it truly means to be human, of what it truly means to be free. Our real self, our real identity, our real freedom is in him. Union with Christ tells us that you and I were made to be part of God's family. And only in finding our place within his family will we ever be free. Galatians 4 and 6, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. You've been adopted into God's family. And living in any family, there are constraints. There are boundaries for our freedom. But living in a family is what you were made for, what you were created for. Romans 8 and 15, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. You say, well, it says I'm not a slave. You're not a slave to the world anymore. But now you have a family and boundaries that are good for you that God put in place because they're good for us. You have found your place, a real home. You found who you are, a real identity in Christ Jesus. And number five, it shows us God clearly. Union with Christ reveals that God is far closer and far more personal than we've ever imagined. He's not distant, and he's not a God who is willing to only be at our convenience. If you think that, you do not know the God that we serve. And understand this, and I say this with absolute love. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. It is not about us. It's not about you, and it's not about me. Union with Christ removes us from the center of our life and places God where he belongs, at the center. But this means that we get to be part of something far bigger and far greater than our own life because we are being integrated into God's life. You say, what does that mean? Our life story is integrated into him, into his life story. You don't have to discover who you are. You don't have to create some image for the world. You don't have to achieve anything for your identity. You don't have to choose or invent or reinvent your identity. Your identity is not within you. It's within him. Self-understanding is inseparable to who God says that we are. We, that first song, all these things that God says about us, do we believe them or not? Who are you? I can tell you it's not a matter of your, your own preferences. It's not a matter of your own choices. It's not a matter of your accomplishments or affiliations. You no longer stand alone. You no longer stand apart. And you no longer get the credit. But you also no longer get the blame. Now I pray that sinks in. You are who God says you are. So who are you? Now, I started to develop a list of who the Bible says we are, and it got too long. So I'm going to give just a few. And please, by the Spirit of God, hear these. You are his child. You are his temple. You are his people. You are his bride. You are his body. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are free. You are a new creation. You are in Christ. 
Why do we have so much difficulty in believing these truths? You say, well, I believe them. Do you? Do you live your life believing like you believe those? Do you see everything that happens in your life through that or something else? When your world falls apart, do you see it through, doesn't matter, I'm loved by God. I'm his temple, I'm his people, I'm his bride, I'm forgiven, I'm a new creation, I am in Christ, and I will see what's going on in my life through that. When you get that bad doctor's report, do you see it through these, or do you see it through the world's perspective? How do we convince ourselves of things too good to be true? How do we change our worldview? How do we change our perspective, our mindset, how we interpret the events and things of our life? The Bible uses marriage and adoption as two ways to describe how our union with Christ changes our identity. Now, marriage and adoption have a legal aspect but they also have a relational aspect, two different aspects. There's a legal aspect of marriage and there's a relational aspect of marriage. And adoption is the same way. When you get legally married, the law gives you full right and privilege of a spouse. When you are legally adopted, you have full rights and privileges of a child. Now that's the legal aspect. But relationally, it takes some time. Okay? Now, I don't know if some of you can even remember when you got married, but you remember the first week? Did you feel married? I mean, I mean, oh, let me say this. The f- second month. Yeah, the first week, you really feel married because you're really happy, aren't you? But relationally, it takes more time. Sometimes it even takes years to integrate into this identity that I am the spouse of Carrie takes time. A newlywed person doesn't keep a copy of their marriage license in their pocket and pull it out every day and says, yep, it's true, I'm married. I am really, really married, legally married. Woohoo! I hope you don't do that. If you do that, please make an appointment for some counseling. Okay? But what turns the legal truth of being married or being adopted into a reality of that relationship. It only happens as we live out that reality. I only come into the relational aspect of marriage as I live my life as a married man. As I stop looking, I stop searching, I stop fishing, you know, if you will. There may be a lot of fish in the sea, but I've caught my limit. And the game warden's watching. But you say, how do we live out that identity? Okay, there's two tests. Remember, I was a professor in in seminary. Love test. 60% of my students failed my test too. So test number one. Now, this is how we can test if all this is starting to sink in, okay? If all this stuff about union with Christ is beginning to at least get in our head, that we're starting to get it. Number one, you're really threatened by it. All this stuff I've been talking about for four weeks, it is scaring you. That's test number one. Because before you can rest in who you are in Christ, before you can rest in your union with Christ, you have to first be afraid of it a little bit. You said afraid? Why? Because before you can take hold of a new identity in Christ, you got to let go of your old identity that you've always known. And that is scary. The way you've always done things. The way your family has always done things. The way you've always seen things. The way you've always interpreted things. You got to let go of it. And that scares most people to death. Before an orphan can embrace their adoption, truly, relationally embrace their adoption, they have to surrender hope that their biological parents will come and take them back. Before a newlywed can embrace their identity as a spouse, they must surrender completely 
their life as a single person. In order to embrace our identity in Christ, we must accept our true condition that without him, we're nothing. And we can do nothing. And we are no one. Not real, nobody, a bum from the neighborhood without Jesus. Jesus will not be a part of our identity. And I want to say that again. Jesus will not be part of your identity. He must be the center of your identity or he is not in your identity at all. And I hope you can hear that with the love that it's intended, the warning that's intended, which means that we must be displaced, and that threatens us. To embrace our union with Christ, we feel threatened because we know it will require us leaving behind the life we've always known. Now, if that threatens you, it's starting to sink in. Okay? Test number two. One, does it threaten you? Number two, does it comfort you? I mean, really comfort you. Why would you choose something that makes you feel so threatened? Why would you let go of your ego and your obsession with yourself and accept this union with Christ? Because union with Christ means replacing our self-made identity and offering us the freedom and certainty that his identity brings. Does that sound comforting? Does all those things I read before sound comforting? We must decide whose voice we will listen to if we want to become who we were made to be. We must change the way we see everything. We must overcome the lie that freedom means doing whatever we want and embrace the truth that real freedom is doing what God wants. His will, not our will. That's real life. That's new life. And it's made possible by our Heavenly Father's love, and it's why he created us. Do you realize God created us to share the love that him and Jesus and the Holy Spirit were sharing together in pre-creation eternity? He didn't create us because he needed us. He didn't create us so someone would worship him because he didn't he would need to be worshiped. He's transcendent. He's above all of that. Okay? We should worship him because he's God, but he didn't need it. He created us for one purpose, to share his love. Sin messed that up, and then he did what was necessary to bring it back. That's how much God loves you. In, 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 in Corinthians, it tells us that you are not your own. But you know what that means? That you're not your own? You're no longer on your own anymore. And there's amazing comfort in that. So I'm going to give you some homework. You say, Vance, this is church. This is not the seminary. I'm giving you homework anyway, okay? My true self starting to come out two and a half years later. Okay, I want an assignment. What do you got to do now? Homework. In order to move into this new identity God is offering you, that Jesus died to give you, in order to begin to grasp who you are because of your union with Christ, there's something you have to do. The voice of your old life is not going to let go easily. To begin to listen to the voice that now is within you, the voice of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, try the following homework. Now, this is really, really deep, all right? Okay? I mean, you better expect angels to start singing when I tell you this, all right? Every morning when you wake up, instead of saying I or me, either audibly or in your head, what, for example, what, am I, what do I want to do today? Where do I want to go today? What does this mean to me? I don't feel like this or I don't feel like that. I want, I think, I need, I, 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 I. Try using we. Try it. What do we want to do today, God? Where do we want to go today? What does this mean to us? I don't, we, do we feel like doing this? Does it matter if we feel like doing this? What do you want? What do you think? What do you need from me? 
Instead of having a conversation with yourself, which couldn't be that good anyway, have one with the one who is in you. Talk to God. You say, those kind of questions? Why not? Why not wake up tomorrow as you sit on your bed wishing that time had changed every day and you got an hour of extra sleep every day? God, what do you want me to do today? Or when you're standing in line and someone in front of you needs help, but there's a shorter line over there. God, what do you want me to do at this moment? I mean, you're in me. You're right here. What do you want? What do you think I should do? Instead of you being the center of your life, converse with Jesus throughout your day, audibly or inaudibly. Ask him, Jesus, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you want me to read? What do you want me to watch? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Why is this happening in my life? What are you trying to teach me? Why am I afraid at this moment? Why do I feel anxious at this moment? Why do I feel depressed about this news that I just got? What am I hoping for? Now, I don't mean asking yourself, what would Jesus do and wearing the little bracelet? That's not what I'm talking about at all. Because when we do that, we're keeping Jesus outside of ourself. Jesus is inside of us, remember? That we are in him and he is in us. You say, well, that's childish, Vance. Remember the discussion we had about imagination? Just as phys the physical body can be reshaped through exercise, and just as the mind can be sharpened through education, spiritual homework or exercises or disciplines can reshape our self-understanding and our awareness of Christ in us and we in him. So as you do that little simple homework, that knowledge that Jesus is in me, and I and in him, that everywhere I go, he's right here, will soon move from the head into the heart and become an amazing reality. And no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you will know he is here in me. In time, the more you do it, it will become second nature. And you will discover that which was once only in your head, Jesus in me and I in him, filters into your heart and becomes a new reality in which you see everything. Let me ask yourself a question. Think about the last time you sinned. I don't care if it was 10 minutes ago. If you really believed Jesus was in you, right there, watching you, listening to you, knowing your every thought, your every motivation, your every attitude, your every intention, would you have done that? If you really believed it, if it was down in here, If you really believed he was, is, Emmanuel, God with us, if you really believed what we sang about earlier, that he never, never, ever leaves us, never forsakes us, he's always there, a friend who sticks closer than a brother, would you still have done that? Union with Christ, Christ in us and we in him can become who you are, your identity the once you begin to see everything through that reality, life becomes beautiful. Life becomes free, abundant, full of peace and joy and hope, even in the midst of sorrow, trials, difficulties, and tribulations. And we suddenly begin to live the life God always wanted us to live. You will move from searching for an identity to finding it in Christ Jesus. Please stand. Oh, I'm good. It's 12 o'clock. I thought I had no chance in Hades of finishing that sermon. 
What's God saying to you? That's another thing. He's in you, and I know he gave me this. I know he's spoken because he spoke to me as I made it, as I wrote it. What is he saying to you? How is your life? How do you see and interpret everything going on? Things in your family, your marriage, your workplace, your finances, your health, your mind. How do you interpret it? Do you interpret it through the eyes of Jesus Christ or the eyes of the world, the eyes of your family, society? When difficulties and trials and tribulations come, can you count them as joy? Or you just say, oh, why me? Why is this happening? No, it's okay to ask those questions. As long as you bring God into it, God, teach me what I need to learn with what's going on in my life. Show me, not necessarily the why, but what I'm supposed to do with it, how I'm supposed to see it. Give me your perspective. What is God saying to you? Bow your head, close your eyes, if you will. This morning... I want to just challenge you, one, to do the homework. Now, we don't like this terminology in America, but in the church, the person that God places, and God places the pastor over the church, is the shepherd. He's given spiritual authority by God to lead God's people. And it's a tremendous responsibility. You look in the Bible, I mean, honestly, it scares me, the responsibility that's there, that I'm to nurture and care for souls. But it also means that when you're asked to do something, you should do it. So try it. Tomorrow morning, even today, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do after church? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to watch? When you're watching TV, you ever ask yourself, God, do you want me watching this? When you're having that conversation at work that's kind of going off the wrong end, you ever ask God, and you wanted me to be a part of this conversation? What do we want to do today? Try it and see what happens. You say, it's going to make me feel really stupid. It's all right. When it opens up a new life, when it brings that reality that wherever you go, no matter how many tears are streaming down your face, no matter how much your life is broken at your feet, God, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth is in you. And you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't have to perceive anything this way. Even in my own self, after this service, no matter what the result of this service may be, whether you like the sermon, hate the sermon, whatever, it doesn't matter. At the end of this sermon, God is in me and Christ is in me. I am loved. I am forgiven. I am his son. I am his child. I am, I am a new creation. I don't have to work for his acceptance. He's not going to love me less because I didn't preach as good as I should have. He's not going to love me more because I preached better than I thought I could. He loves me unconditionally. He accepts me because of his grace. Try it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for your word. And I pray, Lord God, in this service that you have spoken. Forgive me if I've said anything in my own flesh or in my own thought or with an improper motivation or attitude. But I pray, Lord God, that this word is received with a heart in which I think and I tried to send it. Not only a word of encouragement, but also a word of rebuke. Not only a word of correction, but a word of hope. I pray, Lord God, that we will see this and realize that how much of our life that we do not see through your eyes. The things that we do, 
how individualistic, how selfish we can really be. How we treat you, how we treat your body and your bride, which cannot be separated from how we treat you. That we come to you at our convenience, that we come to you when we need something, but any other time we want you to stay out of our business. That we come to church when we feel like it or when we don't have anything better to do. Not because we're dedicated, not because we're committed, not because we want to love you and love your people and serve you and serve your people. And those things cannot not be separated, not biblically. Open our eyes. Awaken us before it's too late. We're at the midnight hour. I believe the time is short, and I know we've been saying that for a long time, but one day the eastern sky is going to split. One day you're going to come back, and I pray, Jesus, come quickly. But before it happens, Lord, I pray that the lost will be found, that the found will be revived and awakened, and that we will have a Christian worldview. That everything that happens in our life, we see through your eyes. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you're here today, and you know what we talked about is far from how you think. That you don't see things the way the Bible sees them, that the gap is so far that you have a secular, earthly, sinful worldview, and you want to put on those lenses. You want to see things through Christ's eyes. For one, you got to read the book study it. You're not going to understand anything. I mean, understand everything. I've been studying this academically for 14 years and, and total over 31 years, and I'm just scratching the surface. That's why it's so beautiful. No matter how much I study it, every time you can get more, every time you can learn something new, every time it speaks to you in a different way. Not that the message changes. It just opens up new parts of your soul. But then when you encounter things in your life that tell you to give up, to tell you to quit, to tell you to walk away, to tell you that there's no hope, you can see it in a different way. Do the homework. Try it. No matter how childish you may think it is, and see what happens. And I pray that God will minister to you greatly. I do ask that you keep uh, me in prayer today. I'm driving to Alabama. Uh, for I drive there today, and I come back on Tuesday. And uh, just a quick trip to get something that my dad's given me. And uh, so uh, I'm going alone because my family don't love me. And <laughs> now, now the girl's got school, and uh, Kent Carrie's got stuff to do, like peanut brittle and that kind of stuff. And I'm not trying to escape the peanut brittle. Uh, now, he's given me a four-wheeler that he's had a long time, and, and so I want to go and I want to get that and keep him off of it because he uses it like to go get the mail and stuff like that, like 50 feet away. Uh, but uh, just pray because it's a horrible drive, and I got to go through Crashville, I mean Nashville. So, uh, but this week, try it. And that's a con you might have to put a little note card just to remind you. God, what are, you, what are you thinking? What do you want to do? Let's pray the benediction. May these words of our mouth and this meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and my prayer always for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great, great week.